uh, with this difficult situation with the pandemic, uh, how are you doing? How is everything there? Well, it gets on your nerves, but um, trying to make the best out of it. I'm, I'm just basically creative. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an acoustic album. It's the best thing you can do. Use the time, you know. Okay, perfect. And are you optimistic about the future with this pandemic situation? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I know why these things happen um, uh, in terms of spiritual spirituality and stuff like that. It's, um, it's, I, I'm, I, I think it's one of many lessons that are going to come up within the next 30 years or something. Um, it is unusual for our generations because we haven't had anything like that. That's why everybody is freaking out and goes, many go nuts. And, 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 um, but it is not such an unusual thing, really. I mean, things like that do happen um, in every century. And uh, we've had like three of those in, in the last century. Um, and this one is not even... As heavy as the Spanish flu, you know, when it, when it comes to how dangerous it is, in in the, I mean, just for the numbers with, with the Spanish flu, you had about I mean, I've I read you had about thirty million around thirty million death within the first two months, and now we have three million death in one year. Okay, so it's 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 not. Is not a Spanish flu, but um, and usually, usually the the way they went down um, is it's something like one and a half to two years is pretty normal actually. Everything the, the way it goes at the moment is actually pretty normal. Um, how pandemics go down, so that I think there's a good chance that um, that it, things th things will get back to normal next year. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay, let's going to talk about the heavy metal news in, in this year. It's going to be for sure, at least in Europe, the, the new Halloween album, of course. So let's going to talk about this new interesting new record, okay? Right. Uh, first of all, uh, have, you have you decided to call the album simply Halloween because you consider it uh, the ultimate Halloween album? The most we consider it some kind of, kind of uh, a restart, really. Um, it, it, I mean, everybody kind of does. The whole, the whole spirit of the band is, of course, very different now um, than than it was before Kai and I joined again. Um, it's it's always like that. It's a, it's 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 some some sort of an uh, uh, like a third launch of the band somehow. Uh, we we were thinking about a title, uh, and then someone had this suggestion: why not calling it just Halloween? You know. Um, makes sense and everybody liked it so that's why we did it but didn't you consider the title a problem having the first ep also entitled halloween back in 85 no because it's an ep and um ages ago um it's, it's pretty obvious and, and this is not an ep so there shouldn't be any confusion all right and musically if we talk about the music this new album could we consider it as a recreation or of all different Halloween styles, uh, all different Halloween eras. I don't know, it's like a mix, for example, with the Keeper's Time, with the Andy Darius Times in the 90s. It's like a, a mixture of everything. Well, that's normal when you have everybody doing a record, you know. Everybody has, I mean, when Kai writes a song, it has, he has his own style. So 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 does Waiki, and when Andy has his own songwriting styles as well. So if you make a record together with seven people, that's what comes out of it, you know. It's and it 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 turned out quite balanced. I would have wished for Kai to have written like maybe two more songs or something, but he was just lazy. So he came up with the with Skyfall, and that one's long. So you can you can say it stands for three songs, you know. But um, that's that's what I personally would have liked. Like maybe two more songs of Kai instead of two of the ones that I don't like that much on the album, which I won't tell you. But um, that would be my perfect uh, kind of uh, record. But everybody has, everybody in the band would have done it slightly different if it would be just for that person, you know, that's normal. Okay, that's normal. You are seven musicians, different musicians. All right. Uh, you released uh, the, the Pumpkins United single. Uh, did you have songs already written before uh, when you decide to arrange a new album? 
or everything came from scratch? I mean, uh, when you decide, okay, let's go to arrange a new album, did you have uh, already songs already written? I, I didn't write anything for the album anyway. I kind of no. you step back up because we had we have enough songwriters, I thought. And um, I think everything is new except for Out for the Glory. Out for the Glory was a song that, that Waiki already tried to do on the previous Halloween record, but it didn't turn out well. So they, they changed it a little bit. On, on, in, in this recording, it worked perfectly well. I, I, I always feel like maybe that song was waiting for me or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it really made sense when I sang it. It really felt like comfortable, like like home a little bit, you know. And when different songwriters, how how did you select the final twelve songs? Was, was that, it difficult or not really? I mean, I I I kind of the, this is like a, a a bunch of pretty play well played in people. You know, you have you have the this band, most of them working together for centuries and and you have a very good management and a producer team and stuff like that. So things got actually pretty smoothly. Um, it wasn't very it wasn't very very difficult really to to choose the songs. Um, it took me it took me a while to understand down in the dumps and um, and um, the Robert King uh, I like them now and when you listen to the whole album it makes kind of sense because they're a little more crazy they're a little more they have a like down in the dumps you cannot really take serious it's a bit of a, a humoristic song um, but those two I, I really had difficulties to understand he wanted me to when I did down in the dumps I thought it was just permanently high screaming where I couldn't really understand what he was trying to do with it and then I, I said to Andy, you got to do something. You got to do some overdubs or something to make it. And, and he did. They did a lot of overdubs and stuff like that. And then it, it kind of turned out a cool track, you know. But it, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't difficult. The only, the only thing that um, I did not understand at first was the Andy had a, a nice ballad or has a nice ballad, a really, a really great song, I thought. And they... They changed the key, they changed it to a lower key, and that didn't turn out as nice as the original key. So even Andy wasn't happy with the final result, so they didn't put it on the album. But I, I thought it was a great track, so it's, it's going to be on the next album. That was the, that was the only, th only time where there was a bit of a, a discussion about um, this song, because um, I thought it should, should have been on the album. But even Andy didn't like the final result. So um, it makes sense to put it on the next one. Uh, fans, the, the Halloween fans, I remember that you had, uh, I reckon, one song in its uh, Keeper album. So didn't you, ho didn't you have any, any song uh, that was interesting for this new record? That's the reason why you haven't contributed or... I wasn't even tr writing anything. Um, I, I did, I did uh, like a keeper too. I had we got the ride, walk alone. Um, I, I did, a, I did a few, like three songs, I think, on those on those two records. But I, I have, I haven't been writing songs for a long time. I've just started again now. I'm just started to. I'm, I'm re working on an acoustic album that I'm just doing for myself. It's, it's going to be released next year, but uh, um, that's to me like the the beginning of songwriting again. But I wasn't really in the in the songwriting phase, so and I thought we do have so many songwriters in this band, and I was actually thinking that uh, Kai would write more. So I didn't I didn't feel like that, that there's really a need for me. But uh, maybe maybe next time. Okay. Uh, and how did you feel working in the studio with the with your old partners and with the the new guys as you call them uh, Sasa and Daniel? How did you feel working with them in the studio? Dennis, you mean all of them? Yeah, I would, that was. I mean, I knew all of them. I, I mean, Andy, I I I I didn't know at first, but of course now I know him very well for a number of years. But I have been working with uh, with Charlie even on solo records in the, in the nineties. And I knew Dennis for, from Unisonic and, and uh, Plasma Dome earlier on and stuff. So it was not really unusual, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, who came up with the idea of using Ingo's drum kit in this album? 
Uh, as, we can, as we could see on your previous tours, uh, Ingo is a still very important part of Halloween Pumpkins United. We see the, the solo with the video and everything. Uh, yeah. Who came up with the idea of the drum kit? I think it all came came out of... Um, I once met someone when I was in Hamburg in a shopping area, and there was someone uh, who, was, uh, who was addressing me who was a fan and we i had a I had a long talk for, for like two hours or something with him in front of a, a, a saturn saturn market uh, for a long time and he he said that he has a drum kit that he bought that, that used to be the drum kit of ingo and he wanted everyone to sign inside of the snare drum so he was asking if he could show up like in hamburg in a hamburg show or something like that and and that everybody would sign it, and I think out of that situation that he was maybe trying to, con he was maybe contacting the management or whatever, and and trying to arrange a meeting. I think out of that, I think Donnie had the idea: what if we buy the drum kit from the guy and we record with that drum kit? You know, it, because the 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 drums in the eighties they sound diff sound different. They don't sound like the drum kits sound today. It has really changed. So it has a very very special kind of sound that drum kit but uh donnie had the idea to buy it but i think this 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 uh, meeting the, the the fan and wanting to sign the snare drum i think that's how it came to life so maybe i'm wrong but i thought it it was uh, the, the the previous owner it was a uh, roland grapple is no no is, no 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 okay so i'm wrong all right all right uh, we talk about the life situation. The pandemic has forced you to delay the tour until next year. Uh, I can imagine it will be very hard to be waiting uh, to play live after the album release date. Well, it's not so unusual for us to have breaks, longer breaks, you know, even breaks for two years. It's not totally unusual for, for bands, you know. So I, I don't mind having a break, but of course it's a different situation now. I, I mean, we... We were we were actually all up for the tour last year already. We wanted to to play live again, and now you have to wait until things get get better. Uh, of course, it sucks, but then again, it's something. It, it, it everybody is in the same boat here. It doesn't really matter if it's John Mayer or Taylor Swift or Katy Perry or Guns N' Roses or Foo Fighters or Metallica. It doesn't matter. No one plays live at the moment, so it's like it's like you you, you should not take it personally you know you just it's it's a it's a worldwide kind of thing where everybody is in there where everybody is on hold um but it's uh i think the not knowing when things will get back to normal that's the most frustrating part that there's no you don't really have a clear perspective what's going to happen you know and and how long it's going to take exactly and stuff like that that's the most annoying part and 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 all those people that don't know how to deal with their fears in any other way than trying to find people they can blame for it you know that they get on my nerves too now it's like it's just getting too much the people go crazy it's it's insane yeah okay do you already know how many new songs you will play live there are some i, I reckon some obvious choices like uh, both singles skyfall and fear of the fallen mm -hmm. i am sure you will play best time and uh, any other song that you can confirm you will play live or do you know it already? I don't think it's going to be more than like maybe four or five songs on the new album because there are certain songs you just got to play. You know, you got to play your classics. I mean, that's what that's what most people that come to the show want to hear. And we still haven't played a whole bunch of songs, even from the from the keeper time. You know, I, I would love to to play We Got the Ride or, you know, something like Save Us or Twilight of the Gods, you know, they're, I mean, just from that phase and there's, there are even songs from the indie phase that, that we haven't played. And that's, that's the great thing of having such a long history. There's so many songs that you can play. We could, we could easily make three, three hour sets with, with different songs, you know, um, so it, it'll be a different set, but I, I doubt that we will be playing more than four or five songs of the new album, you know. And if you play Skyfall, it's it's long anyway. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if you play Skyfall, uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys, and Halloween, it's it's already almost like 45 minutes or something. Well, that that, that <laughs> whole set. 
over mm -hmm. half an hour is already gone with these songs, you know. Okay, okay. Um, I have seen you a couple of times, or I reckon in in the last years. Uh, do you enjoy uh, Do you enjoy your your Halloween pumpkins uh, shows more than the shows you did back in the eighties or in the nineties? Because you seems to be really really happy right now. I don't know if you enjoy it more right now than when you were really young, a teenager almost. It's hard to tell. It's very different. When I when you when you're a teenager, everything is different. You 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 still are in a big part of yourself. You still are a fan, you know, of certain bands, and you have a you have a, a different kind of drive when you when you're a teenager or when you're in your early twenties. So the the It was different. I don't think it's better or worse. It's just very different. But what what I definitely have is a, is a much higher appreciation of uh, of everything that we can do. For well, you never know how long this is going. I mean, you can you can see this with the pandemic. Who would have thought, you know, that that, that this this would be the next thing after we played we played the last show we did was uh, um, Rock in Rio in in 2019. We played before Iron Maiden. And it was fantastic. It was an amazing show. It was over a hundred thousand people were there, and you 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 never would have thought that the next two, at least two years, or even two and a half years, you won't do anything because of that. You know. So it's like whenever we 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 relaunch our live playing, I think everybody will have a, especially now after this pandemic, then everybody will have a whole different appreciation. I don't, I don't think that there will ever be any complaints again when you, when you are at the airport and you're missing a plane or you have to wait for a few hours at the gates or something. I don't think that anyone ever is going to be complaining about anything anymore. We'll just be happy to be in it, you know? Okay. <laughs> One of the biggest surprises of this reunion uh, back in uh, three years ago, uh, or four years ago, it was your special relation and feeling on a stage between you and Andy Darius. Uh, before accepting coming back to Halloween, did you hesitate or did you have doubts in regard of your of sharing the stage with another frontman? I don't I know. That's everybody had. I think everybody had. I mean. You It, it's it's also a kind of risky move for the previous band without me and Kai. If you do something like that and it doesn't work out, it's never a good kind of thing to to cut the bank the band back again. You know, the bigger party is always more entertaining than the smaller party. Okay, um, so it, it was there was a lot of insecurities in the beginning, and we did this very carefully, step by step. It was actually one of the main things after I sorted. My my stuff out with Michael Wycath. Um, I I Jan Bayati, who was the manager, he wanted me to fly to Tenerife and spend some time with Andy, just to figure out if we get along because we did not know each other. And uh, I did that, and it, it was amazing. It was it was it was it's it was almost a little scary because it felt like it felt like I know him. I didn't know him before, but it's almost like you know him from a previous life or something. It was like we, we just straight away connected and we, we talked the whole time. We, we, I, I was at least for two weeks there. And we, like we, we he took me to all those places where you can eat well, his secret uh, areas where you have special things, this and that. And, you know, it was really great. And after, after that, we, we did the real first talks about the Pumpkin United kind of thing with everybody. And, uh, No, it turned out really nice, but that's that's one of those things, you know. If something if something ha is, is sort of a karma kind of thing in terms of ha have, having to happen somehow, it just works out. I have been I have been experiencing both with this with this band. When I when I got into this band in in, in '86 and we started, we released the first record and we did the first kind of touring in '87 and stuff like that. For a number of years, everything felt right. Everything felt like it's, you felt like invincible. It, it it felt like it's meant to be. You know, time is on your side. Whatever you want to call it, everything you do works out and it's great fun. And then and then things changed. You know, we had these legal crap going on that was heavy on the band. And then Kai left the band and Roland got in 
And then the whole spirit of the band was different. And then nothing worked anymore. We, we did our stuff. We did things exactly the way we always did. But it just wasn't the same. So I know both. I know how it feels like. And there's nothing you can do. You can, when things are meant to be, they just happen. And, and when they're not, they don't. Whatever you try to do, it's not going to happen. And at this moment, this feels really right. It was, it was like a very... Um, a very important thing for me on a personal level to get these bad things out of the way and uh, and and to sort things out and to forgive and forget that was my main motivation in the beginning but it has become much more now it ha- it, it it sort of it feels like i'm i'm in my mothership i have like re-entered the mothership and it, it feels much better to be in this band than than to be on your own you never know how long anything lasts um, but as long as that stays the same, you know, the, 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 the spirit between the people and the energy that is, that is there, um, it's great. And I, I hope it stays that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one of the countries with a bigger reaction to this uh, reunion has been Spain, especially one show you did in, in Madrid. It was uh, outstanding with a lot of people. I don't know, it was 14,000 people, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you have played the Rockfest Barcelona and you have played the Galicia, I reckon. Um, it's been a special place in this reunion, I think, of Spain. Oh, yeah. Spain is, has always been great, even with Unisonic. I remember some of the, the, the actually, the, maybe even the, the, the best shows that we did in Spain. Um, some of the, we did, I think, one of the very, I think we did. The last gig with Unisonic was also in Spain, I think. It was again with Iron Maiden. I think it was another festival. Um, no, Spain is amazing, especially when, when it comes to rock music and, and, and you know heavy rock music and stuff like that. Um, but it you have that you have that tendency a lot with with um, South America, Italy, Spain. You know, this is the, the the more sunny countries. They 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 have a, a temper that just. Get, goes together very well with with this type of music, you know. Back in '87, you shared the tour Halloween with Dio in Spain. Uh, you played uh, Bilbao in the Basque Country, where I live. Uh, what, what did you learn from Ronnie Gaines Dio on that tour? I don't know. If you have time to share anything with him, or did you learn anything from Ronnie Gaines Dio back then when you were almost a teen or, or you were almost a teenager? I was always a big uh, fan of his voice. Um, when, when I started to get into this type of music, I was 14, and it was Judas Priest, Iron Maiden. Those were, this, this was my entrance into, and, and I stood, I stayed mainly a fan of these two bands. Later on, there was Queen Strike that I, that I thought, thought was great, and definitely Metallica, the first three Metallica records. Those were like the main bands, and, and anything Ronnie James Dio laid vocals on was all, I always listened to that. I had all the records. I had Rainbow, Black Sabbath, and all the Dio solo records and stuff. So, of course, it was a big deal to play with him. We didn't, we didn't meet them much. We had little talks here and there, but, uh, but not a lot, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, was a, it was a great time in general for the band. I mean, and it was, I think it was the Keeper 2 phase, uh, which, which was a, a very strong time of the band. So anything in that phase was amazing. And as far as I remember, we, we did, we, that was also the time when we were touring with Iron Maiden, uh, when they had the Seven Son of a Seven Son album released. I think that's the same phase. And I also remember that as being extremely great. The audience worked well together it was it was amazing they were so loud when we played that we didn't feel they were much louder when maiden played you know which was just a great feeling for a band for a young band uh, opening up for iron maiden in those years and it was it was a great time especially the, the keeper two phase mm-hmm. the ones uh, that does influence you have mentioned both uh, judas Priest and Iron maiden are still active uh, four decades later I don't know if uh, there is any singer you admired back then when you were a kid or a teenager that is a still an example right now when he is, uh, I don't know, his 70s or late 60s. I don't know if you have any example right now from those uh, singers you admired when you were a kid. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Halford, for instance, to me is, is, a, is, a, is a mystery. How I mean, he sings so heavy and he can still do it. He still sounds fantastic, you know. Um, 
it's, it's very impressive. But I think it has to do with being authentic. Halford is, is, is in every way himself. And if you, there, there are singers that try to emulate his type of singing, but they can't. I mean, they can, they can do it for a little, for a brief time, and then their voices are gone. Halford can do it because it's, it's his personality. It's, it's his, it's his, his um, identity. It, and, and that always works best. You have to, you have to find your own ways. Everybody's influenced. There's, there's no singer that wasn't influenced by other singers. That's how you get your idea of doing this. But, but you, you, you have to develop your own kind of style out of it after a while. And that's what, that's what the good ones do. And, and helpful. And Judas Priest in general, to me, when you, when you look at all the records that they have done, I have my favorites, of course, and my favorite records are like from the late 70s through the, through the 80s. You know, with like screaming for vengeance, defenders of the faith. You know, the, the, those were my, and of course the earlier ones, British Steel. Uh, you know, Killing Machine. These records are my favorite records. I can still listen to them because they're so freaking cool. You know, um, um, but what I what I think is especially outstanding was Judas Priest. How creative they were. How many different types of records they did. It's it was never boring. It was it was never repetitive. It was, it was always something fresh. It was always, even the latest record was a big surprise, you know, uh, how fresh it sounds. And and for that, of course, I do admire them to do that. I mean, do you know that they exist since, since the, with Helford since 73? And, and the band existed since 69? Yeah, right. It's amazing, isn't it? And, uh, and, and when it comes to Iron Maiden, I think the, the sort of, fighter that Bruce Dickinson is is very inspiring. I mean, he has been going through many difficult phases in his life and he always comes back, you know. It's like when he had his, this cancer stuff, and, he, and he, which was really bad, you know, this is like a, a very, very heavy thing for your body, you know, this chemo uh, therapies and stuff like that. And he, he didn't sound that good in the very first kind of year. And now he sounds fantastic again. And I find that so impressive. He, and he's a good example of if you if you want to achieve something, you can fight your way back. And this, I find Bruce Dickinson very inspiring, especially, you know, the, I always thought he was some kind of a knight. Like when you see the pictures of young Bruce Dickinson, like a number of the beasts, the way he looks, you know, with the, he looks like a like a like a British knight in, in like in the medieval times. And that's what I loved about him: this energy, this raw power that comes from him. And I and I, and he still has that energy. I, I find him very impressive and very inspiring when it comes to that. You know. Okay. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, you were not really happy with the metal scene back in, for example, uh, in the beginning of this century. Yeah. Uh, you were not happy with the metal scene. You were not happy with the media. In fact, uh, you didn't you didn't want to come back. Uh, however, nowadays you seem really happy. I can tell you because I have seen you really close i have been taking pictures and your shows and you, your face your smile you're really happy what have changed the metal scene or michael kiska i think i have changed i mean it's, it, it is it was a lot of disappointment uh, the way the band ended and then you you make records and you always get you have a lot of this very unfair sort of treatment when you don't try to copy what you did with the pre i thought it was silly if i would have tried to sound like the halloween it would have been completely bullshit because when i naturally write music it sounds different and i just i just did my own records and when i when i look at it when i look back at it now i understand a lot of this a lot better because people have excitement they're excited about certain stuff that you have done and when you do something new and it, it doesn't sound like that i do understand that they're that they get frustrated about it and stuff like that but it's not easy for an artist when you when you do something and and you're not even trying to to sound like like halloween or something like that but that's always what they criticize you for it doesn't sound like that which it was it was not very um it was not very idealistic it was not very art friendly it was it was, and all that came together. I always had these problems with. Um, I like rocking music. I like, I like guitars and, and 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 to a certain extent. But I'm not someone who 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 likes this sort of idealizing of, of brutality and satanism and inhumanity. And I don't want to. I don't. I don't believe in that. 
I know we all have darkness in sight. That's how we learn. God has placed darkness in every human soul as something where you learn the difference between good and evil by. We have to have it inside and we have to experience it from the outside. This is the whole mystery of evil that it's meant to be. It's here because that's the way you learn what good is. Okay, You have to experience darkness to, to, to appreciate light. You have to experience betrayal and hatred to to learn to appreciate friendship and trust these kind of things you always need the opposite you need the extremes to to have freedom and to to learn the difference between good and evil and that's the big secret of humanity because we are one of many creations of the father that is supposed to learn the difference between good and evil so i'm not saying you can't be aggressive in music i'm not saying you have to be just happy all the time i think it's fine to express frustration to express certain things in an aggressive way aggressive music doesn't necessarily have to be anything negative it depends what your intention is but if your intention is to be negative and to idealize inhumanity, and, and, and if, you, if, you, if your message is that you tell young people to have no heart and to be brutal and arrogant and heartless is strength, I think you're poisoning younger people. And I think that's going down within the metal scene a lot. And I'm still totally against it, but my way of dealing with it has changed because I'm... we. I, Halloween was never a band idealizing any of that. We have that hell in the name, but that was not really to be a hell band, but it was more like to be different to the other two Halloween bands that existed in the early years, in the early 80s. There was one band in Detroit, in America, and there was one Italian band. That, I don't know if they even exist. I don't think they exist anymore, but they, they were called Halloween with an A. So they changed it to the E. But it was never a satanic band, you know, uh, and and that's why I, I still love the Keeper records, for instance. I, I can I can I can appreciate even like the the stuff that Andy did uh, with Halloween. It's great stuff there. But it, even even the dark right is not really dark when you listen to it. You know, it's it's um, and uh, that's I I think. Rock music with an uplifting, idealistic spirit uh, can be something great, and I, I don't, I don't condemn the whole thing anymore. The reason why I was so radical was because of a lot of disappointment. You know, it was just it all came together when you, when you, we, when you start as a young dude in a band and everything is amazing and you love it, and then suddenly everything turns into bullshit. You know, disappointment with the band members, with your career, and anything you do, you just get this negative feedback all the time you just get fed up with it so i hated it all i didn't want to have anything to do with it for a number of years and it took me a long time to slowly go back you know it, it kind of it kind of started with avantasia with the recording uh, two songs i don't know how many i did i think it was two songs on the, on the first one and then later on serafino from frontiers record was contacting me with this idea of Plas for Dome, which which I liked, and then through that Plas for Dome, I got get got to know um, Dennis Ward, and then we did Unisonic together, and then Kai joined Unisonic, and you know step by step by step by step, I I kind of came back, but it took a long time. It took a long time, and um, I learned a lot, and it was, you know, even those years after Halloween, where I was in that in that anti phase, it was important. It was a, it was an important phase for me to shape my personality, to figure out what I want, what I don't want, what I like, what I don't like. You know, these these things are maybe not so interesting for from the fan perspective because you're really off the scene and you don't do much, you know, or at least not much that people care too much about. But it was very important for me on a personal level. And I don't want to miss it. And I think it was it was a karma thing I had to go through. And and I think I am stronger now. I think I am wiser now because of everything that I have went through. So I don't have any regrets, you know. Okay. Um, but it took forever. It took it took very long. All right, perfect. Uh, by the way, do you have any special Andy that is Halloween album? Do you like the best? You have mentioned that you like I, the Halloween. I, I really like the. Uh, it's like I, I was I was surprised. I mean, I was rejecting listening to anything for a number of years uh, for obvious reasons. Okay. But now I, I, I can completely freely listen to anything that they've done, you know, without, without any prejudice. And I was really, I understood why 
the the first record they did, the the Master of the Rings. Why that got so well, uh, such a success? Because it is. It doesn't sound like Cube of Seven Keys, but it sounds like Halloween. That's the interesting thing. It has a Halloween spirit, but it's not a copy of previous records. And I think that's what saved the ass of the band. I honestly think Andy Darris saved the band in the 90s because we were not functioning anymore as a band. It was, it was not working anymore. Something had to happen. And he was the perfect guy because he has his own sound and he's, he, he's very determined if he makes a choice that he wants to do something, he does it. And that was exactly what the band needed. He had the focus. He, he brought the songs and everything. And without any Darius and without these choices that the band had made in those years, I don't think we would be talking today, you know, because they held up the flak over a number of years in a very good way. And I, I do really respect them for, for everything that they have done, you know. Okay. That's really interesting what you mean. We have three questions to finish the interview. Uh, the first punking United gig back in 2017 in Mexico was not the best one because you were ill and yeah. it, it came viral. You had some pre-recorded tracks in one song. You told you were ill. That was a one-off. But however, there are many singers using pre-recorded uh, tracks on the stage. Even uh, some of them in the, in the main voices. Uh, how do you see these uh, pre-recorded tracks uh, nowadays? Because... Um, is something that people are talking about the live gigs. Yeah, I, I, I never did anything like that, and I, 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 I would, I will never do that again. It was just a situation where the, where the management and the band wanted me to do it because I started, which is such a difficult phase. It was so, I was so desperate. You can't imagine. You do this reunion, you know, after 23 years or how long it was, and everything. You sell out big arenas and, and big venues and everything's perfect, you know, and you have a fucking vocal cord infection and you can't sing. It was like a very heavy test. Um, I learned later why that happened. Um, you know, I, I, I was kind of, sounds maybe a little strange, but I was kind of reaching out for my spiritual sort of guidance. And it was that I always try to be too perfect. I'm always, I will always want to be perfect in what I'm doing. And, and I needed to learn that's not possible. Fail, failing is part of human, of, hu of humanity, and I, that's why they did that to me. It, it was a very tough lesson, but I was in the situation that I, that I didn't feel like I could do it, so I wanted to cancel, and next time I will. If I'm ever in a situation like that, again, I said that to the manager. I understand we didn't want to start this tour with cancellations and all that. I understand it was a, it was a, it was a choice that we had to make somehow, but if I ever catch a virus like that again, and after like maybe two weeks on tour, I'm not getting better. I'm flying home. I'll just get rid of it because you damaged your health. It was, it was really bad. I, I should not have done this. The doctor later was very mad at me because when you get a virus and you do not take care of yourself, you, you can provoke some sort of an autoimmune reaction. You know what that is? Yeah, I, because my, I was limping. I started to limp like 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 four weeks into the tour. I could only go on stage with like two huge glasses of red wine and painkillers. I was swallowing like a strong uh, ibuprofen. So because I was limping, my, my immune system was getting into my left leg. And, and after the tour, uh, like a year later in, in 2019, I had a, a like a big... I don't know what you call it in my like like around your vocal uh, uh, area you have these um, uh, th thyroid I don't know what they call it this um, this organ there and I had a big ball in there which wow. which had to be operated out and it was very risky because they have to cut the area where the nerve of your vocal cords go and the doctor oh. says if I cut wrong you won't be singing anymore so that was a pleasant experience everything went down well it wasn't cancer or anything like that. But I think it was another result of me not taking the break, of me going through that tour, even though I had a freaking virus. I had a situation like we had like two or three days off uh, um, before, I think, Spain. Uh, there was like two spots where, where you could fly home for like three or four days. And as soon as I got home, I got really sick. And I, I got into bed. I had like high fever. The whole night through, I was sweating my bed, like completely soaking wet. And that went through the whole time. And then when I had to get into the taxi to the airport, 
I got better. It's like you, you, you can tell how your mind controls your body. As soon as I understood, okay, now you have four days, my body said, okay, now the virus can come through. So I was like completely sick. And then I got to Spain and we did that show and stuff like that. But it was it was a torture for my body. I'm not I'm not gonna do that again. It was it was the situation that they said, you know what? We still have the recordings of the previous show, and we do have the recordings of the of the of the rehearsals we did. So you do you sing, and whenever we feel like you fuck up, he's the, the front guy sneaks in those other live recordings. I never did that before, and of course I'm failing, you know, because I'm not used to doing these kind of things. When you do when you do a playback, you gotta be. Uh, doing the same thing than on the recording and I was like holding the microphone to the audience and what my voice was coming through the PA and stuff like that honestly but I don't care I didn't have a choice I didn't have a choice the other choice was to cancel the show and the band didn't want to cancel the show so I had no choice I had to do it but it's not going to happen again next time I fly home when I'm sick like that all right all right so you are against the, the singers that they are doing right now do they do they do that There are some you, you are against the, those singers that are using pre-recording tracks. Oh yeah, it's totally bullshit. I mean, if you you should you should you should sing, and if you can't do it anymore, well, maybe you shouldn't go on tour. You know, um, yeah, I'm, I don't I don't like that at all. It's okay when you have like backing harmonies or something or keyboards or whatever. That's fine when they come like from a pre-recording, but you, the singing should be should be live. I mean, that's that's the whole that's the whole fun of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if we talk about nowadays, if we talk about the audience, uh, nowadays teenagers and really young people have a very, very different hobbies and distractions if we compare it with the, with the hobbies we had uh, back in the 80s or in the 90s. Uh, do you think you will be able to capture the attention of the, of the youngest people that are more, not, not, uh, not about metal because, or about the music as well? because They have all their hobbies, I don't know, games or uh, social media or a different kind of a style of I hobbies. I really don't know. I really don't know. It, it, there is definitely a lot of people out there that care more about the newest iPhone every year than, than bands. And this has to do with, with uh, your culture, music culture actually dying out. Um, I really don't know. I, I can't. I cannot understand how a smartphone can be more interesting than a band. Um, but if, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. You know, if 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 we if we tour and 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 it happens that fans don't show up, we stop touring. If people don't want music anymore, well, then there won't be any more music. You know, it's like. But I doubt it. I think. I think you always go through these kind of waves, you know, with, with the culture. Things get bad and then they get good again. You have you have certain things go in a very horrible way and then it gets better again. I, when you talk to a lot of young people over here in Germany, they do get fed up with um, with a lot of the stereotype kind of stuff that goes down these days. And they, they sort of look back into the 80s and the 70s and the 60s and discover all of the great music that had been recorded in those centuries and and they understand it and they like it i mean i'm pretty sure and i and i hope it is true that that, that there will be a turn to more interest in, in in music because it's uh i mean how can be a smartphone or a computer game or anything like that be more interesting than music It's, it's just pretty weird to me, you know. It's, you, you, I, I play computer games, and I do have a smartphone, and I love technology, but it's not. It has nothing to do with each other. Music is something completely different, and it has to do with culture and life. And, and um, I, I, I doubt that it's all going to disappear completely. Um, but maybe the you know the the music culture also has to sort of reach audiences again. Maybe you know. It's, If you don't, if you grow up not being excited about something, you, you know, you just don't. Maybe, maybe it just needs to. There needs to be ways to address younger people again, so that they that they can get excited about music again and stuff like that. I mean, it seems they are. It, it didn't look like that, that there were any problems with uh, with audiences, um, and I, I don't think it's it's ever going to get that way. But. Um, 
the better the music culture, the more interesting stuff that is happening, I think the more you will attract younger people somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. And to finish the interview, we're looking into the future. Uh, about this interview, you have told me that uh, you are uh, arranging an acoustic uh, album for next year. Uh, you have told, you have mentioned about another Halloween album. Maybe you can write some songs for another one. So uh, we can expect a next Halloween album for sure. I think so. I mean, like I said, life, you never know what happens, you know. But it's like if, if the things stay like, like they are within the band and everybody stays in the band and if we are able to, to tour again sometime within the next two years or something, uh, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we want to do another album. It's a very creative bunch of people. I mean, apart from the drummer, Donnie, everybody can write songs. So everybody can contribute something to, to an album. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of creativity that is possible with this band still. I don't know any other band that has so many songwriters, to be honest with you, in the band. Mm -hmm. And what about this uh, uh, acoustic solo album? Uh, do you do you have a record deal? And yeah, yeah. Do... the he uh, um, Marco Steiger from from Nuclear Blast. He just I, he was just asking me what what I'm doing, you know, in, in the time that we can't play live. And I said, well, I'm, I'm recording an acoustic album. Oh, cool! I want to have it. And, oh, we release it next year. He was just right away interested in doing it. Yeah, so it's 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 pretty sure going to come out on on uh, Nuclear Blast. It's going to be songs of my own, but I will also do a whole bunch of covers. I will record some of my favorite tracks. It's 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 a song from Billy Joel. Um, it's a song from one song from U2. I, I record one Police track. It was all going. It's all going to be acoustic and 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 very minimalistic. And, and, and I'll make my own turn of it. And it's like, the other half will be stuff of my own. But I, I want to record some of the songs that I really love. And, and would you be alone or do we have any guests? Or? Oh, it'll just be me. Yeah. All right. Okay. And, and about other chapters, in, for example, in the last uh, years, in the last decade, you have been involved with uh, Avantasia, Place Vendom, Unisonic, uh, Kiska Somerville. Any of the uh, all of them are closed chapters at the moment, or or could be reactive next in the next years. Any of them? I mean, at the moment there are closed chapters, but we wanted, to, for instance, we wanted to make another Unisonic album. It, it, it was before we did the Pumpkins United thing. We we were we had we sat down with Kai because Kai was just not interested. He was he was interested in Unisonic on the in the first record. Already on the second one, he cared about other stuff much more. He was doing Hunson and Friends and he was doing his re-recordings of the Gamma Ray records. So we kind of sat down and said, "You know what? We we make an, a, a, the you just concentrate in your Gamma Ray stuff. You do you do what you really want to do and we get Gus G in and we we make a, a third Unisonic record with him." And Kai was fine with it. And, and, and Gus G was still with Ozzy during that time. And he, was, he started to write, to, to share ideas with Dennis Ward. And then he said, then he kind of changed his mind. He said, like, I don't always want to be the replacement guitarist. You know, I kind of I I find it uh, not the right thing to do. So, so he kind of stepped back. And, and then Ozzy, you know, got Zach Wilde back into the band and, and, and he didn't have the job with Ozzy anymore. And then he wanted to do the Unisonic, but that was too late because then we had the Pumpkins United thing already going up. It would have been interesting to see what kind of an album we would have had, would have had with Gus G on the guitars. So we, we did a, a couple of more shows with Kai in Unisonic and finished Unisonic like that. But if, 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 um, if Dennis is up for it, and, and Halloween is, is taking a longer break sometime in the future. I'd love to make a, a third Unisonic record with Gus G, actually. I'd love to make an album with the dude. It's a great guy. It's, it's, it's a great guitar player. Um, but it, it all depends on, on Dennis, really. Dennis is, is the one who really has to wanting to do it, you know. And uh, I, I wouldn't even mind sometime doing another Plasma Dome. I always loved it. I, I like this type of music. And... Um, I thought I thought all of those records we've done uh, with Frontiers were really nice records, you know. So it's like 
Yeah, those two, especially those two things, I, I wouldn't mind doing. You know, um, of course, now I'm back with Halloween. I don't. I, I, when you're not in a band, you do projects. That's what you do. I mean, otherwise, you don't do anything. Okay. So I was kind of when when there was an interesting offer, I was I was doing it. But of course, it's not. It's never going to be as much anymore now. Like 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 it used to be when I wasn't in Halloween. But um, I'm open even for these kind of things sometimes down the line, but I can't promise anything, you know. And of course, I can imagine. I can imagine you will always have a connection with Tobias and Avantasia. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Avantasia. I will even sing on the on the new one here. Uh, I, 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 I doubt. I mean, I might show up sometime on uh, one or two shows. You never know. You know, as a special guest or something like that. But uh, I, I doubt that I, I, I'll do a whole tour with them now that I'm in Halloween. But but I will be on, on, on his next album, on the, on the next Avantasia. 